inviting me to, to speak here, and I'm hoping to um, um, add something interesting and maybe close the circle to what Emma Sperry said in the beginning a little bit. Um, um, on 5th of October 1807, Nikolaus Michael Oppel, a young and aspiring naturalist, wrote to his mentor Karl von Moll about his stay in Paris. He had received a stipend by Max I of Bavaria in order to be further educated in natural history. In his letters to Moll, he mentions the natural history cabinets he saw and the people he met. Among them, the great entomologist from Kiel, Fabricius, and Blumenbach from Göttingen as well as Olivier's cabinet. I choose to start off with this quote because Fabricius and Blumenbach are mentioned in it, but that's not the main reason. It, it, it also mentions people, objects, and places at the same time, and these will be topics of my talk. In my paper today, I would like to contribute to the recent historiographical trend of investigating the practices of the sciences and their practitioners. More specifically, I will try to reconstruct Fabricius' involvement in the production of natural knowledge as inter-European scholarly exchange vis-a-vis -vis extra european uh, exploration and colonialism. Additionally, the development of natural history and specifically entomology as an academic field will also be highlighted. And what I present today is, are the first results of a project I started about a year ago as a postdoctoral uh, project on, on the history of, of entomology. Um, so uh, my paper today is divided into three main parts. After uh, a short introduction of Fabricius' biography, I will talk about travel and the use of natural history cabinets. The second part concerns Fabricius' specific classification practices, and the third part will highlight his teaching as professor for natural history and economics. I hope to show, however, that all of these three practices were interrelated and part and parcel of general developments in natural history around 1800. Um, so let me now first introduce, uh, use, uh, I will first use Fabricius' uh, autobiography, published three years before his death in 1808, to draw attention to the self-fashioning of a scholar in the context of the developments in natural history in the second half of the 18th century. Um, Johann Christian Fabricius was born on the 7th of January 1745 in Turner in Denmark. His father was the district physician there and encouraged his, sons, his two sons to study nature in the fields and forests of the Duchy of Schleswig and later in Copenhagen. This amateur natural history immersion at a very early age was typical for middle class boys and indeed some girls in the age of the Enlightenment. So the aged Johann Christian Fabricius goes to great l length in his autobiography in order to conv convince the reader of his upbringing in an almost Rousseauian manner. This is a uh, longer uh, quote I'm not going to, to read uh, because of time. So this self-fashioning as an almost natural-born naturalist is one of the most striking features of Fabricius' autobiography. It's, it's uh, almost um, the, a natural consequence then as well that Fabricius went to Uppsala to study with arguably the most important naturalist, naturalist uh, a large classique, uh, Carl von Linné. He went to Uppsala in 17, uh, from 1762 to 64, and uh, he describes it as a, as a very important period in his life, and also the subsequent travels in Europe uh, helped him to, as he says, to establish his system, and also his career. He traveled the German-speaking lands, Italy, France, Britain, and Scandinavia, he saw a great number of um, insect collections and met other naturalists. Um, at the same time, he also started his own collection of insects. Uh, taken together, these activities, according to Fabricius, led directly to the publication of his first major entomological work, Systema Entomologica, published in 1775. And this was only the starting point of a large record of publications. At the end of his life, he had produced 12 handbooks on entomology in 18 volumes, as well as quite a number of specific articles in Danish, German, and French journals. Additionally, he published widely on economics, general natural history, scholarly travel, and political economy. It's again some part of his um, career steps. His career was, never, was made never far from his birthplace in Turner, 
first as a professor in Copenhagen and eventually at Kiel University. Um, but his life, however, was much more mobile than this would suggest at first. He traveled widely in Europe and lived for longer periods in Uppsala, London, as well as in Paris. Hence, travel was once one of the most important of his natural history practices. And I highlighted some of the areas where he went to and, and lived. Indeed, the taxonomist and historian of entomology, Dick Wayne Wright, called Fabricius an inveterate traveler. He did indeed travel extensively. After his stay with Linnaeus and a short semester at the University of Copenhagen in the 1760s, Fabricius went on a tour of Europe. In spring 1767, Fabricius reached Edinburgh, where his brother studied medicine. He only did stay there as long as he mastered the English language sufficiently enough to see the Highlands together with a chap called Daniel de la Roche from Geneva. The three students visited places and people and of course also collected flora and fauna. As the catalog of John Hopes, one of the Edinburgh medicine professors and eminent bot botanist shows, they even climbed Ben Nevis. and brought back a specimen of Veronica alpina, alpine speedwell, which the eminent botanist John Hope incorporated into his collection. Um, the specimen itself is, is uh, unfortunately now lost. We only have the catalog of John Hope's herbarium. And uh, I was uh, always thinking it was one of the first climbs of Ben Nevis, but I was actually correct that someone in the early 18th century already climbed Ben Nevis. Um, anyway. Uh, so when they read these three uh, young naturalists returned to Edinburgh, um, they traveled through the western provinces of England to London, arriving there in November 1767, three, uh, just three months after they left Edinburgh. According to his autobiography, Fabricius immediately secured the friendship of Daniel Solander, a fellow Linnaean and curator of the British Museum. Via Solander, Fabricius sub subsequently met arguably the most important man in British natural history in the second half of the 18th century, Joseph Banks. This also came at a very pivotal moment in British and indeed global natural history, and we heard so much about it already. It was only half a year before Banks and Solander would accompany James Cook on his first circumnavigation. So Fabricius stayed in London for most of 1768 and also helped with equipping the HMS Endeavour in, in the spring of 1768. Um, so after that, he traveled further in Europe He's, um, and started in his position at the Naturaltheater at Charlottenburg Castle in 1717. Um, in the following three years, Fabricius taught at Copenhagen during the winter term and traveled to London each summer until 1775 thereby establishing a practice of dividing his time between home and abroad, which would eventually become his habit. At this time, when he returned to London, Banks and Solander also returned from Cook's first circumnavigation and had brought back large amounts of natural objects and insects. Thus, Fabricius, as he says, spent his summer in London in true bliss. London's importance for Fabricius' development as a naturalist, as well as its role in general natural history, can be seen on almost every page of his publication, Letters from London, Briefe aus London, uh, published in 1784. Right at the beginning of his Letters from London, Fabricius explains why London and Britain were so important for natural history in the third quarter of the 18th century. And as you can see in this quote, I'm not going to read it, uh, but there are all the prerequisites for successful natural history. Uh, uh, the availability and rich diversity of the material, patronage, private funding, the accessibility, and the community of scholars uh, among themselves and also among pa patrons. He also talks a little bit about the practices of natural history in the cabinets and collections of Europe. And um, I will explain a little bit about this by using also this um, report on his London uh, stays. As far as I'm aware, we only know very little about the actual work of naturalists at the collections with animals, plants, and minerals there. However, Mary Terrell's recent magisterial account of Riamur's network and practices, as well as Martin Giel's notion of the university as a factory of the Enlightenment, serve as inspiration for me for what follows now. I have to admit, though, that my sources are not nearly as extensive as Terrell's, alas. Fabricius' papers are most certainly lost, and he did not keep 
as wide a net of correspondence as Réaumur did, or for that matter, Blumenbach. Um, I will draw upon Fabricius letters from London for an insight into this matter because they provide a little bit of an insight. Um, one of the most important cabinets that Fabricius uh, worked at was William Hunter's. Fabricius praises especially Hunter's ingenious distribution of work and the accessibility of the collections. Um, and he says that uh, especially important was that um, uh, he was, Hunter was clever enough to recognize that nobody can oversee all of the different subjects. So he chose a different and skillful man for each subject. So you already have some kind of a division of, of the disciplines happening at the, at the natural history cabinets, and that's something sometimes overlooked when we um, uh, talk about this. Um, there has been a lot of um, uh, talk about this. So this description about Hunter echo, echoes something very similar that he does and seen uh, at Joseph Banks' uh, cabinet, and I bore you here with the uh, Fraktur and German at the same time. Uh, but maybe some people can, uh, can see it. Um, he says, um, I, I translate it for you. Uh, everybody met at 10 o'clock in the morning after they had breakfast, and then everybody came together. And I quote, the daily workers to which I belong since a long time all have their assigned spaces, their table, their magnifying glasses, their drawers for their papers and objects, and everybody uses everything like he was at home. What you can see here is a description of basically um, very specific work already being, being, being done. Um, and Fabricius' use of the term daily workers and his general description of everyday life at Banks House almost sounds like the description of a factory. Um, as I said, Martin Giel has called the university a factory of the Enlightenment, um, a little bit tongue in cheek, of course. Um, and certainly Banks Soho Square apartments and collections can be called a factory of natural history. Painters and engravers had their own rooms where they were, as Fabricius says, working constantly and daily. Of course, this was no Dickensian workhouse. Uh, Fabricius praises the excellent working conditions and the community of scholars. He was, of course, not the only one um, who uh, noticed that. Uh, a few years before, um, his fellow Linnaean and friend uh, and friend Carpeter Thunberg had also visited Banks House um, uh, uh, on his return from Japan in 1778, and he praises uh, Banks House as an academy of natural history. Uh, Swedish, of course. Um, so, but they didn't only praise uh, the collections. Uh, was equally important was the library, and uh, and the magnificent holdings, and you can see. Uh, a catalog of Banks' uh, library um, ordered by another Swedish Linnaean, uh, Jonas Druander. And for both scholars, uh, Thunberg and uh, Fabricius, it was absolutely clear that the proximity of availability of books and, and, and availability of books was as important as that of the specimens. And that accuses a little bit uh, what Gerhard Lauer says in his introduction about the, the importance of, of books and specimens. Um, um, and uh, I, I, I end here with this, um, this little uh, uh, part of my talk about the, the collections by another uh, quote um, which, with, with uh, which um, Fabricius closes his um, um, report on, on uh, Banks' collections. He says, quote, everybody knows something, a new synonym, a new discovery, and everything becomes easier and more pleasant community. So he was, it was also important to him that the happy congregation of scholars made research fun. Alas, Banks House was slowly being remodeled and specimens removed and dispersed when in 1791 the zoological material was given to the British Museum. This is also maybe the reason why Fabricius chose to favor Paris over London from 1790 onwards. He had visited France earlier at the end of 1768, but could not appreciate it because he was still very infatuated with London and Great Britain. This, however, changed after 1789. Uh, now, natural history uh, and the revolution, which is an interesting fact, uh, attracted him to the French capital. And as you can see here, he looks for the insects, but he also uh, meets the heads of the revolution. Uh, and befriends the Roland family and Milan. 
Um, I have no time, unfortunately, to discuss also his political writings on um, i.e. serfdom and university reform, but it's an interesting connection, his natural history work, his uh, teaching of political economy, and his engagement uh, with the revolution uh, there. Um, Paris was, like London, also a meeting place, and it's very unfortunate that he didn't publish an account of his uh, time in Paris, and there might be some reasons uh, we can maybe discuss uh, later. Uh, the political situation being one of them. Um, as I said, he tells us very little about his actual work in Paris, uh, but the Parisian um, cabinets and the collaboration with fellow naturalists proved as vital for him as the ones in Uppsala and in London for the further uh, development of his system and his publication. So let's now turn quickly to his systematics. Fabricius had been outlining his systematics already in his first major publication of the late 1770s, the Systema Entomologiae from 1775 and the Philosophia Entomologica in 1778. His system was based on the mouthparts of the insects. Um, um, in 1790, however, Fabricius published a short article in the Proceedings of the Danish Natural History Society which contains his manifesto of the importance of systematics in a nutshell. Additionally, he also explains the task of the natural historian. Uh, so, well, whether we want to read it's German or Danish, you can do either. Um, but I translate it into English, of course. So, what he mentions is that for him, first, the soundness and certainty of the genera are the most important prerequisites for any system. This was the only way for him to determine the species. Hence, for him, it was, uh, quote, the most excellent work of the true natural historian to discover and fix the characteristics of the genera. He argues for the utmost importance of only using characters in taxation that are discernible for every species in the genus. For him, the mouthparts are the most natural characteristics of insect genera, since their form is built up according to the nourishment of the insect. Their nourishment, in turn, influences the whole mode of life and their ecology, to use an ahistorical term. Uh, he, he's not using ecology, but the way he describes this, you can um, say it's, it's almost ecology. Consequently, those natural genera which display the same nourishment and way of life must necessarily belong to the same genus. That's Fabricius' reasoning. And one interesting uh, line that he writes, and that I have to still make, sense of, and I'm not quite sure if I can. Um, he says that he uses these little parts, the mouth parts, keeps them, and he also uses them to uh, make comparison. So apparently he had them with him when he traveled these uh, certain cabinets. And I've talked to etymologists, and it's actually possible to do that. It's a bit weird, because, uh, but this, it's an interesting story, because uh, you could also um, argue, have, um, um, can add to the arguments about uh, the presentation of um, drawings and, and pictures and text and also the specimen itself. But unfortunately, there's not really a time to go into that um, today. Um, so I will now turn to the last part of my part paper uh, to this other practice at the university called teaching. Um, the content of a Fabricius academic lectures can be discerned by looking at the printed lecture catalogues. Although these catalogues are not entirely reliable for an exact analysis, analysis of what was actually taught at the early modern university, they are a very good indicator for what students could expect nonetheless. During the 30 years that Fabricius held the chair for economics at Kiel University, so he only had half of the time of uh, Blumenbach, um, we can follow, follow the development of his curriculum very easily. Bearing in mind, of course, that these lecture catalogues did not necessarily mirror what was actually taught. The following statistics of Fabricius' lectures in Kiel have to be taken, then, with a grain of salt, though. Nevertheless, the sample can certainly show the diversity of topics and fields that Fabricius covered in his uh, 30 years at Kiel University. And, of course, he also wrote textbooks, and it would be an interesting uh, research to compare these with Blumenbach, and that's one of the things I actually want to do here as well. Uh, uh, Blumenbach uh, calls him, him one of his best friends, actually, 
uh, but there are no letters. Um, so I attempted to structure these uh, um, information about the lectures um, over the 30 years of his uh, career. And um, there are some flaws because uh, we don't have information of every year and the information gets uh, smaller at the end of his life. Uh, he seems to be uh, more lazy in, in uh, counting or maybe everybody knew what he was teaching about. Um, so, but I still have uh, clustered them uh, a little bit. So you can see here the dis distribution of, of topics. An overwhelming majority of his lectures were in indeed devoted to natural history. That was part of his chair. Agriculture follows suit, uh, and according also to the de denomination of his chair, police and cameral sciences, um, the German Polizeiwissenschaften. Interestingly, he also mentions excursions. Uh, yeah. Um, um, uh, but he did this for 10 semesters. Um, economics, uh, the, the next one, is um, a tricky category because it almost certainly features in all of the other cat categories. And his um, natural history textbook is actually full of economics, and his economics textbook is full of natural history. Um, so his special field, entomology, was only mentioned explicitly in four cases uh, here. Uh, but that might be... Um, um, also, um, the fact that it, it, um, it might have been included in his natural history general courses. Uh, and also, he had a, tu a duty to teach more general classes anyway. So I finish now this uh, little um, analysis um, by some specification within the groups of agriculture and natural history. For the former, it is interesting to note that Fabricius seemed to have given animal husbandry more attention than crop farming. One is tempted to see this as a reflection of the agricultural structures um, of, the, of, his, of his surroundings because livestock breeding uh, played a far more um, uh, important role than um, in the agricultural so uh, section uh, with meat production and specialized dairy farming in the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein and in Denmark in general. Indeed, Fabricius paid great attention to the local circumstances and detail. In his autobiography, he specifically mentions um, that he traveled to the dukedom of Schleswig and Holstein, and was keeping a uh, diary uh, because he thought that uh, before he could take up his post as a public teacher of economy, he needs to be uh, acquainted with, uh, as he says, a thorough knowledge of my native country. This accurate journal is apparently lost. Only one page remains uh, and is it's kept at the Oxford University Natural History Museum, and that's <coughs> one of those pages, and it's actually a very interesting document, uh, because you can see here, it's, it's the 49th day that he spent there. It's July, so he didn't uh, take the, 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 the day, but he, the, the um, so it's like the, 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 it's not the 1st of July, but it was the 49th day of his travel. And he also refers to a page and a number, and I'm most certain it refers to Linnaeus. I still have to find out which copy of, uh, but it's, it's most certainly a Systema Naturae, uh, but I have to uh, do some more research on, on that. Um, and he, uh, one of the interesting things is the mulberry tree in a uh, manor house in uh, southern Schleswig. So this shows us that he actually did work on the ground before he became uh, a natural history uh, teacher. Um, he also traveled to other places during his um, uh, tenure as a professor in Kiel, uh, most importantly to Norway. And there's a letter to the authorities begging them to give him money to do that. And it's basically, um, the, his argument is uh, he needs to do that, uh, that in order to be more knowledgeable about the products and, uh, and the um, specifics of the land uh, in order to be a good teacher of economics. And he did travel in, 17, in May 1778, he asked for the permission. He traveled in the summer, and already in 1779, he published a travelogue. So it's a very fast publisher as well. Um, and, uh, and of course, that gets a lot of criticism as well, because it's not very exact at times. Um, but he does publish a lot. And, and the travelogue to Norway is, um, is basically an inventory of the natural riches. Uh, 
uh, as well. So in conclusion, um, I quote again his uh, autobiography, and uh, he says what he, like his, how he taught and how he lived, and he says that after 1790, he always traveled to Paris in the summer to see the uh, collections there, and uh, that were just arriving from Persia or from the Orient or from the South Sea or from Egypt. Uh, and he also was uh, expecting Humboldt just returning from South America. Uh, and in the, in the winter, he taught at Kiel uh, to be uh, to uh, teach and uh, and uh, actually do what he's paid for. Um, so what you see in this quote again is that research and teaching were um, equally important. Um, friendship was uh, important. That the, the, the people he mentioned, uh, sociability, um, accessibility, and novelty. I mean, he mentions all these new specimens. Um, and also politics and science, as, as I've shown you earlier with the uh, information about the revolution. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll just stop here and uh, have a little disclaimer, just a little bit. Um, uh, but maybe we have some time for, for questions. If not, I'm happy to talk uh, in the break. Mm -hmm. Thank you.